j'ai la tête de l'eau Quand la rime est au culot Les feux sont pour ton goulot Je sois au pôle nord, au pôle sud ou au pôle emploi T'es au bon endroit, pareil que le boulanger pôle emploi Donc va gagner ton pain, ton RSA, les miettes font la baguette Pas sûr que quand tu seras PPPP, tu kifferas ta retraite Le travail c'est la santé ou bien fleuri mérogis Pour tous les banquiers qui se prennent pour des numéros 10 Puis ça licencie à tour de bras dans les entreprises Et la France en va se retrouver Les doigts de Sortir la tête de l'eau quand la rime est au kilo Le flot je vais pas vous faire un tableau, c'est la crise au bas en la société dans son dos. Faut y aller au culot, pas se rire au crime au noir, on sort ton vide de la sorte de l'eau. Y'a de l'espoir dans mon stylo, il faisait noir dans mon stylo, aujourd'hui le printemps est clos. Tout le monde est bancal, une minorité domine tous les autres, on trouve ça normal que le gramme l'emporte sur le kilo. Quand ça spécule à Londres, on licencie, à prendre ton combo de l'effet papillon, on passe à l'effet domino. Toi, société, mon train wagon, j'étais ton cheminot, tu m'as pris pour un con, tu m'as plumé comme un bobino, 10 ans de loyaux, bon boulot, derrière un bureau, moi le bon blaireau, qu'on m'envoie valser comme un boléro, t'as voulu que je me barre, baisse le volume que je te parle, on évolue, puis l'on s'écarte sous des volutes de cigares, café moulu que je prépare, de lait du sucre comme un hectare, il a fallu qu'on se sépare sous clair de l'une dingue et de gare pour que j'allume enfin mes parts que je te salue et que je repars loin des talus qui font en part qui gêne la vue et le regard toi que j'ai le papier buvard dans mon élu mon étendard tu m'as exclu dans la clochard alors à moi que t'aurais le chaud sortir la tête de l'eau quand la rime est au kilo le feu se voit des goulots je vais pas vous faire un tableau c'est la crise de bas où la société est dans son goulot faut y aller le culot pas sur rire au trémolo donc sans ton vide de l'air sur Y'a de l'espoir dans mon stylo, il faisait noir dans mon stylo Aujourd'hui le printemps est clos That was fun. Had everyone suddenly with all their uh, friends and family on, which was good. Hello, everybody. How are you all? It's delightful to see you all. I'm delighted to every time to see lots of the same faces and lots of new faces each time from uh, all over the planet, which isn't bad, um, I've got to say. I'm really impressed that you can make it this many weeks into the, uh, into the lockdown in various countries. I think this is our 10th. This is our 10th event. Um, so um, has anyone been to 10 of them other than me? If you have, oh, amazing. Crew, well done. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, actually, we think what we're going to do is have um, a fun conversation tonight and an interesting conversation tonight. And then we're going to take a little break, actually, which is partly why I'm hoping you will sit the poll and give me a bit of advice give us a bit of advice on how to do this going forwards so we we think it's time for a little summer break um and want to come back with something fresh and interesting and inspiring in the autumn but that doesn't mean we won't be in touch with you in the meantime so um we'll find a way to do that but um thank you for coming and i'm just going to flick into my uh auto key so here we go so uh welcome the district resistance thank you so much for coming you know we used to always say um, we're apart and we're staying apart, but we could still come together for a bit of fun. And um, that was always kind of the ingoing premise of what, what we wanted to do. Um, as you know, one of the things that, uh, that I should probably introduce myself, actually, sorry, I'm sure some of you have met me before, but uh, my name is Leo Raymond and I am um, lucky enough to be the CEO of uh, Grey Consulting. Um, one of the things that we do is help um, clients and organizations make their brands more competitive and we do it inside and out. So that means specifically we, we think about how to help companies exploit new growth spaces, uh, usually through designing propositions and business models. We help reposition brands so they can you know, revitalize their purpose and really connect with people. And we help um, support the organizations that makes those changes. So helping transformation from the inside. That's basically what we do. Um, but anyway, en enough about us. Um, I'll introduce you in a minute to the speakers. And uh, we have a very special guest tonight um, who's going to mix up the format a little bit in the middle for any of you who have been to some of these before. Um, and we'll chat to them. And then I'd love you to get involved. So you can put questions in the chat box. And sometimes I feed them in as we go through our conversations with individuals that are speakers tonight. 
And sometimes um, we get you on screen to actually ask your question yourself if you want to do that. Um, we are recording, you should know that. So that means people can watch it later on our YouTube archive, which you can find under Grey Consulting on YouTube. Um, but I wanted you to know that we're recording if you do come on, on screen. And thank you as ever to um, the lovely Nick from Hyper Island who um, always supports us and helps me not panic too much about the crazy Zoom tech when you have 25 to 55 people or more on the, on the Zoom. So uh, thank you for that. So tonight's theme is let's design a radically more um, inclusive workplace. And um, it's something which I think we, we really want to talk about. We've got this rare moment, haven't we, where we can reset and, and possibly reboot the workplaces we may be about to return to in, in some form. And, you know, if that ends up just being a conversation about how much we go into the office and how much we work from home, then I think, what a waste, frankly. Well, that would be awful, really. So there's a chance now to really rethink the way we run businesses and the, and the cultures that we create in those organisations. I know that lots of you have many different angles into that problem and are very involved in many ways and we'll have lots to say about that tonight really. So the, the key question is this, how do we make more inclusive, healthier workplaces that create opportunity for all and that, you know, that make us better and make us well, that don't just make us sick? Um, and our speakers will really address that tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers then and we'll get on with that. So um, the first up tonight, we've got, we've got three and a special guests. So the, the first speaker is, um, and, and Leah, I'll do a little intro and then you can tell me if I've got it right or anything you want to add. Um, I'm really delighted and, and really, really pleased that Leah Satar can join us um, this evening. She's co-founder of a, a business called The Other Box, which may, maybe we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, Leah. But have, they've received you know, multiple awards and accolades and, and Leah has really led that, um, including being, some of you know, the a UK has a uh, a women's organization in the advertising industry where she's a future, a future leader, but you'll certainly know that she's um, one of the Forbes 100 women founders and Ad Aids Women to Watch in Europe. And she sits on, uh, she's a member of what's known as the Fawcett Society's Race Disparity Unit, Exploring Pay and Progression for Women of Colour. Did I, did I do that justice, Leah? Can I come off mute? Oh, coming off mute. Um, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Did I miss anything? Did I miss anything that you'd like to tell us about some of the work that you do before we get? We'll get into it in a minute, but I just thought anything, anything particular you want to know about your background? I think, uh, oh yeah, we're going to go into a little bit more detail. So I guess for top line, that's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Good, thank you. And then uh, next up will be um, Yulia O'Mahony, who I who I met. I've met Leah before, actually. And I've seen Leah talk at sort of industry type events in the past, but Yulia is someone that I met through the distant resistance. So. Um, who says you can't make new friends in a lockdown world? Um, Yulia was former head of diversity and inclusion and well-being for a very, very famous British retailer called the John Lewis Partnership that many of you will know. And now she's helping companies to unlock the power of people to drive competitive performance. She's a former management consultant with Bain, amongst others. She's a Harvard MBA. Um, and she's currently doing part-time neuroscience and psychology degree or MA at King's College London. Which is it, Yulia? You there? Yes, I'm on mute. Hello. Excellent, excellent. Um, I'm doing postgraduate certificate and it's brilliant because you can study uh, completely online. And um, yeah, so it's really, really good. Highly recommended. So maybe we'll talk a little bit about that as we get into that. And then um, my surprise guest tonight, um, who is a friend and former colleague, um, and um, I don't actually read how I describe Mike Aladef. Mike, say hello. Hello. <laughs> how are you doing? Uh, all right. How would you describe me? Um, well, I would say that you are uh, professionally a marketing strategist. You are a uh, football fanatic, I think. Certainly, yeah. correct me. Are you wearing Manchester United red for a reason? Is that to do? No, with... no, no, no. Just totally, totally. You are um, a, a challenging provocateur in a corporate environment and in life generally. And um, I first met Mike because he came to work at Grey as a kind of intern and managed to smash his way into that organisation despite having some challenges in a little working context at the time um, because of having cerebral palsy, that's fair to say. Um, yeah. But once he was in, no one could believe how brilliant and smart and on it yeah. he was. So. And, it, and it took me six years to get out there. 
<laughs> we wouldn't let you go. Yeah, wouldn't let me go. So, and last but not least, there's Mark Mark Evans, who um, many of you will recognise or know. Mark is um, no stranger to forums and and speaking environments. Um, I can't remember quite how I met you, Mark, but Mark's one of those people that every single time I talk to you, we we end up. I mean, I always find myself kind of getting a deeper sense of like. Um, psychology and how we can all be better people and make our teams happier and so I think you know for a marketing person Mark I think is a very deep thinker about teams and teamship and wellness and well-being and I know that neurodiversity is something that's very close to your heart. I probably should say that you're the managing director now of marketing and digital at um, a very very big general insurer in the UK called the Direct Line Group that um, many of you will know. Um, you run, a, you run a big charity event that you've founded called the Sprinterthon in aid of stand up to cancer and have marketing accolades as long as, uh, as, long as your arm. Is that, is that a fair description of you, Mark? Well, I'm very flattered. Uh, yeah, that does the job nicely. We do, we do always end up having quite a profound conversation, so very interested to see where we'll get to. But uh, no, I'm very, very well, flattered. I hope I don't let you all down <laughs> tonight with the challenge one. We'll give it a good go. Okay, so listen, um, let, let's crack on. So... Um, Leah, you're up, you'll be first. Um, everyone else will pop on mute and then we'll, we'll get into the conversation. And I will, um, guys, you're welcome to sort of pop conversation questions into the, into the chat as well as we go. So Leah, tell us a bit about, about yourself and what's really specifically motivated you to help create a more inclusive workplace where more people could feel that they belong. I think um, for that, I'm just gonna go to the beginning of why we started The Other Box. So The Other Box was founded in 2016, mainly out of frustration that the diversity conversation wasn't very reflective of people like me, uh, people like us, me and my co-founder. So being a woman of color from a working class background and there were various other parts of my identity that were constantly being left out that conversation. And when people were talking about diversity, it was always in relation to gender. And gender was very binary, so it was uh, um, women, mainly white middle class women. And again, as a woman of color from various other parts of my identity, I couldn't relate to that. So we really wanted to challenge that and make sure when people are talking about diversity and inclusion, they're coming at it from a more intersectional point of view. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened four years ago. Now, today, the way that we stand is that we run courses, training and consultancy on anti-racism, anti-oppression, allyship, unconscious bias and we also support and nurture a community a creative community of over three and a half thousand people um, all around the world um, and just creating a space where they feel seen and feel heard so also it's a space where people can share opportunities share news events with one another but also resources as well so yeah that's kind of what we do in a nutshell and that's kind of how we're challenging the inclusion conversation too with me. I mean it's ama it's amazing what you've achieved and you said um, is that four years you said that yeah amazing to have moved so I mean for you personally to have moved and created so much energy and impetus in just such a short time and and to be you know you met, your name is recognized and well known very broadly which is oh. incredible but do, do you feel like the pace that you're own endeavors and business have kind of gone through is matched by the pace of the world around you or are you frustrated by how things how fast things are changing to be honest i am really i am really frustrated that we've been talking about diversity and inclusion for four years and again we stand on the shoulders of so many giants who have pushed this conversation forth and have studied it and have put things out over, over like decades and decades and decades if not centuries about it and it, what's really unfortunate is that it took the brutal public murders that happened in June 2020 of George Floyd, Ahmad Arbery, for the industry to really take diversity and inclusion seriously and not consider it a nice to have, but a must have, and that they must be challenging their biases, they must be challenging their prejudices, their racism, and really bringing that conversation to the forefront. And for me, it's frustrating that We've had clients who worked with us from the very beginning, but also now all of a sudden there's been a massive spike in people who are now prioritizing diversity and inclusion, which is amazing, but it's like, why did it take you so long to care about other people and equality and equity? So yeah. you can tell I'm quite fired up about it. No, I can see that. And, and we'll talk a bit more about your, I think maybe some, I might see if you're open, open to talking more about how you feel about it. It's like later in our, in our conversation, but I guess we should, you know, we should cut to 
What do you, one of the questions about the whole point of this thing is like, what does a radically inclusive workplace look like? What could it be? And I might, maybe, maybe the word inclusive is re- even wrong. I, mean, I had a conversation with someone earlier today saying, it's not about that. It's about creating a sense of belonging for everybody, but we can get into that if you want to. But do you have like a vision for something different that you're kind of aiming towards? Like where, what's your destination in your head? I think what's really interesting is that I think representation is really important because I know for me it was a massive factor in my confidence in my career so not seeing people like me um, reflected across senior leadership uh, advertising juries um, awards juries all of that sort of thing so representation is really important so for me an inclusive environment would nurture that representation but also just support their employees support their teams um, I think a really good question has just come up in the chat around the question around equity versus um, equality and really thinking about how you can create equitable environments that support and nurture people who come from marginalized backgrounds and it goes beyond race. I'm talking about religion, neurodiversity, I'm talking about um, disability, class things that are supporting people outside of London as well, like major cities. For me, it's about really having workplaces that reflect the environments around them. And so um, making sure that you're serving your communities, but also like your audiences as well. So tell me one of the things, I mean, forgive me for being not as intelligent and informed as I should be about this, but this debate about, or not debate, this discussion, you mentioned equity versus equality. I don't know, I don't understand the difference. Could you explain to me what that means? Yeah, so... Equity is giving everyone what they need to be successful compared to something like equality where everyone is treated the same. So where equality aims to kind of promote fairness, it can only work if everybody's starting from the same place and needs the same amount of help. And there's a really great image, I'm not sure if people have seen it in social media, yeah, there's a few nodding heads, where um, equality is where giving everything keeping everything the same across the whole organization, whereas equity is really basing it on the individual needs of people. And so when it comes to recruitment, when it comes to retention, when it comes to how you're supporting all of your employees from and their needs, you're supporting them on that individual basis. So that's interesting. And I, I feel like the conversation, so I, I guess I, I, I ended up running an advertising agency in 2017 and we, rebranded it with the names of our Jewish founders temporarily to celebrate the founding centenary, centennial. And I also on a personal journey at that time of really thinking much, and I was, you know, with my team around me, really thinking about inclusion and we did lots of work and we built an advertising diversity task force and yada, 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 a huge amount of stuff. And it amazed me that the conversation, I feel like the con- I feel like even though I felt quite informed then that you have to really, it's very hard actually almost to stay up to speed with the level of thinking about what's next and what really needs to happen. So understanding this piece of language around equity makes a huge amount of sense to me, of course, but it's not, so, I, I haven't come across that until today. So I guess that's a sign of my own, it's not about me, but how, how do people get to, it feels like it's a fast moving conversation and you can very easily put a foot wrong. How does, how do people stay up to speed with the latest and, and make sure they're kind of doing the right thing rather than pushing, like you could think the equality was a great thing to push until you hear that actually it's not fair if it doesn't give personal, treatment to individuals based on their own start point sorry long question no do you know what it's i think it's and this is what we teach a lot in our training as well like it really is about um your own individual journey and there's no sort of certificate or t-shirt that you're going to get for being the perfect ally or being the the perfect dni ambassador because it's constant work Mm. language is constantly developing and moving um culture is constantly shifting and so being it just keeping your finger on the pulse of what's happening it means really analyzing who you're surrounding yourself with so what's the media that you're consuming where are you getting your news from who do you follow on social media what's informing your your biases your prejudices that you may have um because we all have them we all have biases we all have prejudices we all have we all are a part of this um racist homophobic transphobic system which prioritizes certain groups over others and so it requires for you to do that deep personal work but it is a journey and I think you're completely right a lot of people especially in what we've seen over the last few weeks are scared to have these conversations because they're scared to say the wrong thing but silence I mean it's it's something that's been going around social media silence is violence and so if you've got a platform if you've got privilege and we all have like levels of privilege 
it's our responsibility to use that to support and nurture marginalized groups and so we can all be allies in different ways and so also as well by the people that you're following on social media you're then be able, going to be able to keep kind of track of a conversation but i also understand that when you go to work as a creative director your job is to be a creative director it's not to be a diversity and inclusion um leader manager whatever so it's really difficult to kind of straddle these two worlds but if you look at that, that's really that's really fascinating I, t I tell you why one of the things that we sort of learned but i'm not sure i've actually delivered it was um if you make diversity an item on an agenda like a, an item on a list of things to do it always gets bounced off the bottom yeah or often can and this the, the point was instead it should be it should run through everything because every decision you make every opportunity in your business and, and beyond just advertising that is potentially influenced by the caliber of the people that you can bring to the problem and the more diversity you have the better your solutions and does that do people talk about articulate that as being a real challenge to work out how to keep how to integrate it into their daily lives given the, the example you just cited people don't like change i mean that's what we definitely <laughs> notice you have to want to be on this journey and for me i think one of my frustrations is, is what i hear a lot is um, especially from like men, it's, oh, I, it took me having a daughter for me to care about feminism or, you know, I've, I've now got a black wife. So now I care about racism. Why is it, why does it get to that point for you to care about other human beings? It yeah. should be something of like, we all share this world. How can we all be working as part of it? And I think also just back to your other point of that diversity and inclusion needs to be a whole business topic and it needs to be fully integrated across the company. So your values, your mission, your outputs, your campaigns, your marketing, your strategies, who you're working with, your HR policies and procedures, diversity and inclusion needs to be across all of that. It can't just be a, oh, we've got a HR and a people team and it's their job to do that. And also it can't rely on the marginalized people within the organization and the employee resource groups to, to dismantle and um and change the workplace it needs to be something across the whole organization yeah i'm going to ask you about that i think you and i touched on it when we spoke on the phone the other day but does the does the burden of designing a more inclusive workplace or a more equitable workplace fall equally on everyone's shoulders and, and if it isn't what can we do to make sure it does i think just to like really simplify it is that a company is made up of people and we all have an individual part to play in that. And you'll see the typical effect. So your individual, the way that you are within your team, and then the team makes up a, a department, a department makes up a company. We all have a part to play in that. Mm -hmm. And so I think um, it, it, it always does fall upon the people of color, the disabled people, the LGBTQIA people within the workplace to drive these changes. But I, th I really, really encourage leadership and companies to really look at emotional labor and the cost of that on their employees as well. So if you're expecting people to do diversity and inclusion work alongside their actual day job as well, that needs to be reflected in their job description and they need to be paid accordingly as well. And that's something that we feel really strongly about that you can't be expecting these people to do it for free because it's exhausting. Having to justify your existence every single day at work is an exhausting experience. For anyone, I mean, that's, all, that's awful. That's absolutely terrible. So, tell me a story, if you can, about to give us a bit of, um, not to like molly coddle us, but to encourage us to make changes more so in our own working lives. Like, is there a story of a thing that, that you can think about that you've, maybe you did or that you've seen that where you saw significant change actually happen quite quickly? So I'm just going to use a personal example because the first thing that came to my head and it happened after um, the, the Black Lives Matter protests happened and I'm very vocal on my social media anyway but on my Facebook which is predominantly my family and close friends um, I kind of got into it with my white uncle and you know he's my he's, he's he's my uncle like he's known me since I was a child he's also got mixed race children so this conversation of racism really affects that but for him he was like he doesn't really believe racism exists because it never really affected him even though I would tell him and I'd try and educate him as much as I could it was a really difficult conversation and what I realized is that I when you're having these conversations with people you have to do it with a great deal of empathy and um, patience and there's actually something that's something that um, the other box CEOs mom says actually and it's better to deal with situations with honey rather than vinegar because it's 
a more smoother process. So when you're trying to have these difficult conversations, yeah. doing, I mean, I, I hate the fact that we have to mollycoddle, but I also understand that it's quite difficult for people to wrap their heads around because some, some of them, is, they're just starting this journey, but doing it with empathy and kindness, I think that's something that I, that I do with my clients. But then when it comes to my family, I had less patience, but actually I realized once I was able to do that, I was being able to have greater impact and able to change behaviors and raise awareness, which ultimately is the goal for inclusion, right? Like interesting. I mean, we experienced someone from um, extinction, very different context, but someone came on from extinction rebellion about four distance resistances ago. Anna, she was great. She was a great character, but she was very aggressive about it and quite antagonistic. And I think, we all recognised that she was probably right, but we all felt turned off by it. I guess that's the vinegar versus the honey kind of mentality. I'm conscious of, of um, time, and I want to make sure there's lots of time at the end for questions, but I, I could talk to you for another hour, so I'm sure you get bored, actually. But is there, what, I wonder what the sort of most, I guess the question would be, what can we do now? What should we do now? Now to um, not waste the kind of momentum that's currently happening. I know it's frustrating to you in some ways, that, but but... What can we do now? What should we do now, right now? What can we do? How can we use the moment? I think, um, I mean, obviously, first thing I'm going to say is do the other box training, of course, because this is what we kind of delve into. But I would also just really like to encourage people to, um, the first thing, the first step that you can take is to really look at your own racism and look at the way that you are oppressive to other people, because we live in a system that's inherently racist. So ultimately, we're born into this system it's, the, it's just the way that we that we live. It's the way that we've been brought up. So really begin to examine it and um, forget about quick DNI fixes and start looking at histories of, and, and understanding the histories of of, uh, of where we come from. Because most of what we were taught about history was one sided and it centers whiteness. And so I would really encourage people to read up about history. Um, I'm not just talking specifically around the slave trade, but I definitely think having that awareness as to where, why it's got to where it's got to right now and what's happening is happening, looking at these deeply embedded structures. So just research your history, read about the empire, read about like how people of color were massive and part of World War II, but again, our, our stories have been silenced. So I think in terms of a first step, just really start to examine our own prejudices and the way that we are oppressive to other people. Yeah, I'm very interested in that. Yeah, it's interesting that you chose history as a, and know it's, that's been a big feature of the conversation that's been happening with statues. And we had someone on from National Trust last time who talked about that their attempts to recontextualize the things around us. But um, let's come back to more because there's a huge conversation going on in Zoom group chat that I can barely understand. Yeah. <laughs> One of the minutes to have a chat. But um, Thank you, Leah. That's really, really a good start, and we'll come. We'll come back in a second. So, um, next up, we'll we'll crack on with the, um, with you, Leah. Leah, how are you? You're yeah, very well. Thank you. Thank you for having me on Distance Resistance. Can't believe I'm a speaker now. I'm usually the listener. Well, you know, well, well, everyone potentially is a speaker, aren't they? So, tell Leah, tell me, um, did anything, tell us a bit about yourself if you want to, and then tell me what, if anything, did anything particularly resonate with you from what Leah was talking about? I think it's, uh, I had quite an eclectic career. And um, so I started as a programmer in former Soviet Union, which is an interesting thing. But it's, it, what resonated with me is um, the themes of shared humanity and things that, um, things like empathy, kindness, curiosity, trying to understand where the other person is coming from it is absolutely universal and it doesn't matter where you go to. So, um, and in my experience, um, the way I arrived at the inclusion and well-being is as a consultant and turnaround consultant, doing some restructuring projects, also working in commercial roles, you just realize there's so much attention that is given to numbers versus people. Um, so when you do the planning and analysis, it's kind of 80% of what's going on is about numbers and 20% is about people. Whereas when things actually, when rubber hits the road, you need to implement something, it reverses. So it's like your plans are only probably 20%, it's, but people make all the difference. You know, this famous culture, it's strategy for breakfast. And I think what, what was interesting for me coming from a very numbers oriented background, you just think actually as a line manager, when I got my first big team, you spend most of your time on people 
and that's what actually makes the biggest difference and yet from corporate perspective it's not something that you know you have hr and hr policies but it's never it never is a strategic priority though companies say well one of our values people are our biggest assets but usually it doesn't mean a huge amount and sometimes people are treated more at units of labor rather than you know people um but also what i've observed is the best teams i ever worked in um, are very diverse and people bring their different perspectives and it makes things interesting it makes things fun and you know you unlock a lot more of this creativity we're all trying to get our heads around now because it's like the world is uncertain who knows what customers will want who knows what will transpire from the economic perspective so you need everyone's input and everyone's creativity so i think at this this moment is fantastic in terms of resetting the business agenda and saying actually it is essential to hear all this different perspective to get all this different information into one place and move forward on this basis I find, I, one of the one of the phrases that i've heard i'm sorry this isn't the questions we talked about but it was just nice to talk isn't it Yulia? so one of the um phrases that we heard when we had and you'll remember this ada paris on quite a few a few sessions ago was about um mm -hmm including othered voices so people who are made to feel that they don't belong i mean is, is has that something which you've been able to we know well, particularly i guess in perhaps either in your career before john lewis partnership or even in that role ha, is that something you were ever able to kind of actively make a difference to is it is it possible to to sort of force change like that inside a company a, a big company um I think it's possible, but it needs, you need to work on many different levels simultaneously and it needs to be almost like on the agenda all the time. And when I say at different levels, you, it almost like it, it's, it doesn't need to be a kind of big ta-da moment. It's more about everyday conversations and what happens in teams and how teams interact, but also how you celebrate difference, how you bring people in so they feel that they definitely belong. And also it's, um, you know, I think in, there's a psychological term, you know, budding psychologist and all that. Um, it's when you have this critical moments where people actually test your values, when it's something that, you know, if um, you have a person in the shop who's wearing hijab and she's one of the shop assistants, and she hears racist and unpleasant remark, which unfortunately happens quite frequently. The key moment is how her teammates and how her manager react to this. In, and it's really crucial moment because it can be either, well, it's a customer and, you know, the team can look after her and just kind of say, well, it, it, it's wrong behavior and we're not going to do anything. But at the same time, the company wants to get the money from this customer and the money is higher priority. So the signal that it sends to this individual that, you know, she needs to try to fit in because the money is more important. Whereas if the um, manager says, actually, this uh, behavior is not tolerated here um, and actively protect this person. And it's probably, it, it, it's quite a um, tricky example, but it's, it sends a very different signal. So, and the person's experience is added up from all these different interactions with all different team members. And I think it's just the more positivity you get into these conversations, which are driven by curiosity and asking, um, you know, just interested in a different person as a, another human being, then, um, it can make a difference, but also changing the recruitment practices, because what happens is a lot of companies, they kind of fish in the same pond and then they want to get the same different people um, from this process. But if you change your recruitment practices from requiring certain experience to competence, it changes um, it changes the situation. And actually um, it was quite successful in General's partnership in IT um, architecture, just hiring for competence and aptitude for system architecture. And it attracted a lot more women than um, other programs, because if you try to recruit for experience, you get the same person. But to do the job, it doesn't necessarily mean you need experience, you need competency, and some things need, can be trained quite easily. So I think it's just combination of different 
elements and communication and signals that you send can really make a difference. But there's no silver bullet. No. One of the things I was interested in in your, because we've talked about uh, workplace well-being, and I was I wonder if you could help me understand. I guess it's one of it might be or maybe I'm being stupid, but help me understand the interaction between. Diver creating a diverse and inclusive workplace on one hand and then workplace well-being there's obviously a connection point where is how does that connection work i think um i think it works through culture because if you think about workplace well-being or personal's well-being in work context it has two elements as a collective and as individual and as individual is uh, you know all the different benefits that you have um, and how you um, look after yourself and whether you have a chance to actually replenish your energy and um, have emotional support when you need it. But culture forms quite a big um, element of the collective well-being. So if you have great relationship with your teams, if you have fantastic line manager who cares about you and you feel that you belong, it definitely has a very positive effect on your personal well-being as well. So I think these two need to work together but also I think it's um, the teams that feel proud of their achievements and that they support each other. They obviously, they would be more successful. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's fascinating. I mean, I was reflecting on what Leah was saying earlier on about how, you know, people feel, people feeling, um, I guess people who feel like they could easily fall into an other type of voice, feeling all, like all day they have to prove themselves to themselves and to others in their workplace it must be a very exhausting and that must make people ill, I guess deep down you know in terms of how mm. they is uh, to what extent i'm one of the things that you you've written a paper which um you kindly share with me and, and i'm sure people can access you uh, can get in touch with you to, to find out more about it but it was about the idea of a workplace that heals people um, which, which has i guess an opposite which is that a workplace makes people sick and we've all mm. many of us in many contexts have felt um that workplaces can make us stressed and ill and unhappy and so on tell me tell me is that is such a thing possible well, I'm hoping, um, I hope it is possible. And, uh, but I think it's, um, I think because of this shared humanity, because and I believe the human is a new digital because we're just so obsessed about digital at the moment. And yet um, human brain and individuals, human individuals of all different experiences, they have so much to bring to uh, creating better solutions for everything. And, um, and for example, take things like, um, you know, Valuable 500 campaign and think designable. It's creating products using the experience of people with disability, creating products that benefits everybody. And I think that's, um, and if you create a workplace that actually nurtures people, um, it, first of all, it doesn't cost a lot of money, not at the level that IT systems would be anyway. Um, so it's cheaper, it's more complicated. So it's not kind of, it, it's, uh, it's simple, but it's not easy to implement. But if you create great cultures where people are welcomed and they belong, and also you achieve balance between um, people's personal lives and personal needs and their um, work. So you create this environment which actually supports you because and also everyone wants to achieve something in their workplace. It's uh, people are driven by achievement and doing a good job. So um, it's just creating this environment can um, really be um, a great thing commercially, but it's, it's something that may require more of a longer term view. And hopefully current environment suggests that companies which are resilient and have longer term perspectives, they're more likely to attract investment as well. I guess compared to 2008, you're right that people will be looking, when people look at the firms that do well out of this situation in 2022, 2023, they might well be looking at it through the lens of diversity, inclusion and well-being in a way they might not have done in 08, 09. It'd be interesting to see how that, how that plays out. Isn't there a story about porridge and John Lewis and how that helped them? <laughs> Yes, yes, actually it was in Waitrose. We did, um, it's almost creating, investing a little bit um, in people's well-being. So there was a bit of a psychological experiment in terms of creating a bit of scarcity. So in several Waitrose shops, we um, did porridge trial. 
and we um, communicated it as trial and unique. And um, the idea was to uh, drive, there was, first of all, we set the ambition for Juno's partnership to become healthiest workplace in the UK. So within the framework of this vision, we said, okay, we need to experiment with breakfast. And okay, it doesn't include everybody porridge because if you're gluten intolerant, it's not great, but we just thought, okay, we'll start somewhere. And with this experiment, um, what transpired is actually, first of all, people were telling us, well, if somebody likes fried for breakfast, they're never going to try porridge, it's not going to work. But interestingly, people started gradually to um, eat more healthily. So they, they were eating porridge. But the most important thing was that they felt that they are part of something bigger than just you know eating porridge. And it was something that the attention was put on them. So they really mattered. And it was something they can shape themselves as an experiment and they can do lots of different things with it. So it was the small thing which cost absolutely nothing um, cr suddenly created more of a health movement within um, this particular branch. So it was a very small thing but it had quite big repercussions in the end yeah so I, I think it'd be interesting to understand from a diversity and inclusion point of view whether there are there are and i'm not and i take leah's point about there is no silver bullet and systemic change is hard and big and and so on and we shouldn't be looking for a band-aid or a plaster to put on something and it'd be interesting to see whether there are a sequence of dominoes that you can knock over that begin to create a bigger a bigger impact and i think be interesting to talk about that. Maybe what we should do is come back to that theme towards the end and, and circle back and see how we can connect up our, our three or four speakers. Thank you, Yulia. We'll um, do some more in a second. Now, as a sort of slight change of pace, I'm hoping anyway, depending on how Mike um, goes at this, I wanted to give Mike a chance to um, interject. This is like a half-time team, uh, half-time chat from Mike. Um, and we'll, we'll aim to finish by seven, by the way, and have some good time for questions. So, so Mike, what we talked about was whether you might do a couple of brief reflections and a, um, a couple of maybe even one, I don't know, provocation or two to the conversation to kind of give it a kick up for fun. What do you think? I need to put you on that. I need to unmute. I'll unmute you, Mike. Oh, no, that didn't work. Yes. Yeah, so, so, you're on. Well. Uh, thank you, Leo. I'll try my best to be succinct and not swear because the end story is several times not to swear. You're on Channel 4. Um, but I think one of the things that becomes very abundant in the first two conversations is that despite like, working in companies that are people-centered and try to put people first, the current working environment completely fails to do that. So why, why we spend so much time thinking about our people and how to look after them, but we are quite instinctively bad at doing that. So I think that's like, how can we create a rock piece environment of the future that really puts our people first? And obviously that taps into Yulia's kind of well-being point. So could you put well-being KPIs in people's contracts or in a kind of manager's appeals. Like, I know target setting has got a bad name and there's no silver bullet, but there does seem to be like the need for some metrics to kind of show what you're doing. Um, my kind of second publication really is that should we stop calling it diversity and inclusion um, over the course of today because of this doing this i've read countless articles saying that diversity and inclusion is a very bad name for this because to your latest point it gets put on a list as a tick box as a tick box rather than something that is hardwired into business. Um, so could you call it kind of like human management instead or something like that, which again 
kind of reinforces um, that people point. And then I guess my third and last publication is we work in highly competitive environments. And um, this is a half time team talk. So I'll use a sports analogy. Obviously, very good football clubs like Man City, Liverpool, United, they're very kind of highly driven. Um, but I wouldn't say that they're always nice places to work. And I'm sure Klopp or Kyle Guardiola loses it with players at some time. So how do you kind of kind of balance that kind of need to look after after people with like and sometimes it is not very nice working in an ad agency or consultancy because you've got clients breathing down your neck, you've got deadlines and not really hard that it's just a fact of life. So I guess that's my last provocation. How do you balance the need to look out for people with delivering a high quality product in what is and will always be a competitive environment? Yeah, that's very interesting. And I, you know, I know that for a lot, there's a lot in there, which maybe I might throw some of your questions to our speakers and see if they want to pick one or two of those up. But certainly in my experience might be Yes, there are sort of soft KPIs on surveys and morale and retention and so on, but the ones that they beat you up about are you know, revenue and profit cost, simple as, which doesn't seem like the way to drive the behaviours that you're talking about. Does anyone, any of our speakers, including you, Mark, want to pick up, and then we'll talk, Mark, as well, but want to pick up on anything that um, any of Mike's points? I thought they were brilliant. Yeah. I can, um, I can have a go <laughs> at one of the points anyway. I think that's what is interesting in terms of the connection between well-being KPIs and competitive environment. I think it's, um, and somebody in the chat mentioned donut economics um, and as a different approach to actually, if you optimize for GDPs, you only measure, you achieve the same result. If you so if you don't have any balance in your KPIs, it's very difficult to achieve positive outcome. And I think, but the, the other element is longevity. So if all you're driven is by is quarterly numbers, then it's very difficult to achieve any trade-off except for, um, for profit. Mm -hmm. But I think there was, um, there was some research that I, I can't remember now from the top of my head that's, in terms of companies' longevity, you'd need if longevity is what you want to achieve, and if you want to have a team that is the sustained performance, you need to accept some sort of ups and downs, but you need to remain driven. But at the same time, you need to accept that you need to make trade offs for the benefits of the future as opposed to just here and now and maximize for efficiency. Because if you drive efficiency, then diversity goes against the principles of efficiency because the system will be actually demand sameness because sameness is fantastic for efficiency. Because if somebody who is already, you know, if you're a manager, you're recruiting your image because it's very easy, you know how it's going to operate. But if you need to manage not for sameness or efficiency, but for uncertainty and predictability, then you need different qualities and you need different points of view. So I think it's if you have this change of how you approach strategy from managing purely for efficiency to managing for um, uncertainty and um, what Margaret was talking about, Margaret Heffernan about the um, uncharted territory and preparedness, then you just need different qualities. That's amazing. Uh I haven't thought about it like that, but of course that's true. Mark, was there anything, Mark, I'm going to come to you next, but was there anything, Mark, in what, um, you know, what Mike was saying about giving people either well-being KPIs or stop making DNI a separate thing, really think about hardwiring it and the language that you use might do that or, or even nasty competitive environments. Did any of that resonate with you at all? Yeah, so um, we, we, we discussed before as a group that Mike would come in and lob a few hand grenades and we'd all sort of, you know, 
uh, crap ourselves about what we would say. But I, I think the point about working environment is a really interesting one because what is the working environment post COVID? So that's just one to noodle. But on, on the metrics thing, I think it's really interesting. I'm, I'm a bit Nanny McPhee on that. Um, so when organizations um, don't, don't think they need targets, but they really do, then you, then you need them. Uh, but there comes a point in time where you know you you don't need them you may think you do but you don't and actually it's 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 um escalated into being it's just a culturally uh established thing uh and, and i loved i think for hana a couple of times in the chat talked about acceptance and i think that combines a couple of things that mike said i've heard people say no it's not dni it's ind but that just seems a bit sort of you know <laughs> like, uh, a, bit, a bit too subtle for me anyway but there's something around this is a, this is about cultural acceptance deeply held beliefs that cuts through you know, what metrics we do or don't have, how we badge it or don't badge it, what the work environment looks like post COVID. I think that, so thank you for Hannah, that's, that's a, a word that I've not really heard you use and you've bunged it in the chat a couple of times and it seems to be, it elevates the conversation to, uh, you know, what's the intent of every individual. And, it, and we'll go on to talk a little bit, it links quite nicely to the way that we set out our purpose as a, uh, and values as a company. So thank you, Mike. Very good. I mean, tell, tell us a bit more about, about um, I guess, what's driven you, Mark, in, in the work that you've done over the years. Because I, I always get a very strong sense, and I've never worked for you, but, and we've only ever met really in the industry, as it were. But over that time, I've really had a strong sense that you have a powerful set of values and you're trying very hard to build a very positive, healthy workplace around you. But what, what, tell me a bit about you know, what that, where that comes from and, and, and how it's progressed over time. Yeah, so, so I mean, it's been mentioned about uh, part of job description, and so on. So I, you know, I'm, I've, I've never had a DNI or HR related job. It's never been in my job description. Um, but there's two very specific reasons why I'm sort of drawn to the conversation. Um, one is, I suppose, you know, we're all a product of our past, and I just, I, my parents probably brought me up reasonably well, and I just do have a strong sense of justice and equality or equity, uh, maybe is the word. Um, you know, uh, somebody once said the films that you like are really a good representation of your, your your position on the world. And so if I put aside Kill Bill and other Tarantino films for a moment, uh, films like Green Mile and Shawshank Redemption, they just talk to me because they talk to justice. So I think there's something deeply held about a sense of justice. The other is, um, it, it, I can't hide it very well, but I'm, I'm a competitive person <laughs> uh, and I played uh, high level team sports and it was always diversity that won you know, uh, particularly the sport I played, it was the balance of different traits and characteristics, which, which was successful. So I think, you know, it's not just a cliche, winning is predicated on diversity. Uh, and, and in uh, a sports setting, that's diversity of skills and experiences. <coughs> in, uh, in a workplace, I think that's very much around diversity of experience uh, and, and, uh, and thought. So same, same thing. So also, I suppose, you know, I'm, I'm married to a nurse who keeps me pretty grounded and in that, that, that notion of, um, you know, uh, in a world where you can be anything, be kind, is her sort of expression. And so, you know, to, to try and be caring. Um, and, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's where I get gratification. So it's not an entirely selfless thing. I no. get a buzz out of, yeah. of, of seeing people achieve their potential. Do you, is, do you have like a, a vision for a kind of radically improved kind of workplace that you something in your mind that you're working towards i guess i can see your values and so on coming through but yeah well um so one of our founding values we're only eight years old as a company one of our founding values was bring all of yourself to work um and so i think that's quite helpful because that does chime with acceptance uh, and says that people should be uh, whatever they want to be really and should be valued for that and and and, and prized for that um I, I guess my take on what's a good outcome here, you know, what would be radically different uh, is that all of these different aspects of, we're talking about different aspects of social justice, they're all equal and it's not a competition. No. Well, actually, no, it completely is a competition. What I mean by that is an organization ha only has so many resources uh, time, effort, energy, money, lunch and learn slots, external speakers, time at an exco. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it's, I think it's only when you take it up to a, a much higher cultural level and embed it in your purpose and values that you're going to reconcile the fact that there are so many competing priorities that you're con you know, like whack-a-mole, never, never quite getting it right. And so, so for us to say our purpose 
fundamentally our purpose in a sector that should be the many looking after the few, that's where insurance started, it is to make insurance personal, inclusive and a force for good. And, and COVID has been a great opportunity to test our mettle on that. So, I, I, you know, I, it, it's not a, a new thought, but it's got to be deeply cultural. Otherwise, it's kind of for nothing. And that's really interesting because I was talking to Mike, you know, in preparation for this session, we had a chat about not getting into kind of um, an arms race around, you know, the language of, I think it was an arms race around which disabilities are more important than others. So you're saying rather than worrying about whether you need to make the signage more useful to people who are colorblind versus some other initiative for sake of argument, it's actually more about embedding a much deeper sense of acceptance and I just want to make sure I understand what you're saying, a much deeper... Yeah, I know. Maybe I don't explain it brilliantly, but I think you, you'll know you're there in a culture when you get the balance of these things right. So I'll, I'll give a really specific example. I campaign massively around neurodiversity, so there's a lot of dyslexia in the family, and you know, I've seen the superpowers, the good, the bad, and the ugly of, of neurodiversity. And so I've really bought, fought for share of voice, because it's invisible, bring it to the fore, uh, brought in speakers, uh, established that. In the rearview mirror, I look really... I feel quite guilty because we haven't done nearly as much of that velocity from a from a, a Bayman ethnicity point of view. So I would say we're really good on eth on um, uh, sexuality, on gender, on neurodiversity. Pretty good on physical ability. Could be better, but the Bayman strand has been underrepresented. Yeah, and it's because I think we're kind of feeling our way into a culture where these are very natural conversations. It probably took us a couple of years to really get comfortable, truly comfortable, with the mental health conversation. So there's a bit about miles on the clock, but you know it should be effortless to navigate around these competing priorities. Um, but you know, it, but it isn't. It takes accumulated experience. That's very interesting. And do, I mean, one of the things that's going to kind of flip the conversation slightly and talk about because you know you you have a vantage point. You sit in a very senior role in a big organisation, and you sit on the board. And what is it that captains of industry, and I mean by uh, gender neutral captains of industry, but what? Um, what should they stop doing to try and help some of this change happen, do you think? Um, well, it's been mentioned a couple of times and Leo was very strong on this. Uh, you know, I, I think um, stop, I'll flip it around, stop, stop thinking that you've got the answers um, and be curious. So it's, everyone says on the back of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, you know, listen and learn. I, yeah, fine. But I think ultimately there's an element of curiosity and I think the good news is that marketers are inherently curious. I think it, the curiosity is the sort of the cornerstone of any half decent marketers toolbox. Uh, and so, you know, I think start being more curious is the, is the potentially the silver bullet. So from, from my point of view, I've had lots of really uncomfortable conversations with people that have really made me feel a bit stupid and naive and dumb. Um, so for example, so uh, talking to Jo Bay, who many people will know the other day, where she said, you know, you're brought up to think you are less than. Uh, and uh, our head of ops, uh, 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 um, uh, an Asian guy who says, you can never know what white privilege actually means. You can never know what it's like mm -hmm. to get on a tube with a rucksack and everybody looks at you like you're a terrorist. So um, my, my, my point of view is to, as, as, be, as has been said, is, is to sort of just be, be in a learning mode and very specifically, I suppose, get, get reverse mentored uh, so that I can open my eyes to what I never knew was possible. In, in fact, my daughter now says, well, you, you, well you, you used to quote Churchill all the time. Uh, didn't you know? And well, no, I didn't know. Um, and I, I still you know, got mixed feelings about that. Um, but but you know, I had no idea. I had no idea how history has been portrayed. Uh, and so stop believing you know the answers, Except that you're pretty dumb, and be curious about what what's really uh, what's really true. Yeah, for instance, is there anything with Leo? I lost you there a little bit, a bit wobbly. How about that? Um, sorry, Leo, I couldn't. No. Can you, can you hear what you said there? It might be me. No, I can't hear you there. Um, okay, we'll take the opportunity, perhaps while Leo drops out and maybe rejoins. If, if there's anyone who wants to ask a question um, from the audience, maybe you could type it into the chat box and then we can find you and bring you back in or raise the hand symbol if you can find that and see if I can spot you. Um, anyone? Thank you, Nick. Oh, there you go, you're back. 
Mm. The question, let's have a question if you want, because I'm happy to... Uh, that's what's happened, actually. Anybody got a question they want to ask? I'm sure we don't care. I thought we'd just carry on. Oh. oh. Rory, what's your question about, Rory? Are you there? Ah, there you go. I've unmuted. That's helpful, isn't it? Um, well, firstly, just to say thank you uh, to the speakers and yourself, Lee. What a brilliant conversation. So thank you for that. Thanks for the invite. Um, I guess my question, Mark, it would be great to get your perspective on this, is how you broker uh, really open and expansive conversations that allow your peers to feel stupid, as, as you've described, to feel ignorant of, of matters, but in a way that's non-judgmental. Um, uh, and to sort of preface that, I guess, in, in my experience, one of the challenges has been having conversations at a senior executive level where people are able to ask questions that reveal their lack of understanding without them feeling judged for, for lacking that understanding, as it were. So I'm interested in your perspective on how you broker those conversations. Yeah, I, um, it's, a, it's a really good point. And I would say in some of the organisations I've worked, that would have been much, much harder than the one I'm in now, which, has, it, which does have a, a good heart. It's, it's a good hearted organisation. But um, a couple of thoughts, really. One is I think we learned a lot from the mental health conversation a couple of years ago in terms of recognizing that it starts as quite an awkward conversation, but then we let go of something, prepared to show a bit more vulnerability, and then kind of everybody jumps in and it, and it gets going. Um, but, but, but very specifically, just literally last week, um, we had an all colleague session, um, and then um, uh, and, and for me and my, my leadership team, we talked in front of everybody about the journey that we had been on about feeling stupid and naive and, um, and how you know, we needed to change some of the things we were doing uh, and, and just, I, I suppose, played it out. Um, so it does start with the shadow of the CEO. We're very fortunate, uh, Penny, our CEO, um, is, well, I mean, what can I say? Like quite a normal person. <laughs> it's not, not that common. I mean, Leo aside, obviously, uh, <laughs> in terms of having a CEO who's just not narcissistic meg megalomaniac. Uh, and we've got a female chair. So we've got unusual, we've got a female chair and CEO. And I think that's a good precursor to good conversations. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm rambling a little bit now, but I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's about the leadership of the organization showing genuine authenticity that they, that they do give a crap about these things. And if it's in any way tokenistic or superficial, it is sussed out in an absolute nanosecond. Um, so it, you know, it comes down to a very high bar of authenticity of leadership. I don't know if that exactly answered the question, but um, you know, there, are some, there are some good preconditions in our organization, which leads us to, you know, um, I wouldn't say being good or great at this, but being predisposed to lean into the difficult conversations. Um, thank you, Rory. Has, has anyone else got a question for Leah? And what I'd love you to do ideally is pop your question in the sidebar and then we'll, we'll pick it out. Just or even a, a rough theme, because I think that really that does help a little bit. And also gives everyone a chance to prepare, frankly, for what's coming up. <laughs> there was a question. Um, Isabel, do you want to ask your do you want to ask your question? It'd be great to get you on if you were up for it. Just, you know, adds a bit of variety. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Hi there. Um, I'm Izzy. I'm actually a member of the um, I guess what we what would be our diversity inclusion committee at Grey yeah. and um, we're currently hoping to roll out some uh, educate, educated sessions across Grey over the next few weeks and um, as part of that we are going to be discussing microaggressions in the workplace, unconscious bias and I think one of the things that I'm currently struggling with a bit more is as someone that's a more junior uh, POC in the agency is how to have these discussions with more senior peers without them feeling like uh, they're being attacked for something they may have said in the past that they haven't realized is a microaggression. And I think, you know, your point earlier about honey, not vinegar, is, is such a valid one. And, and how to really translate that so people don't feel like, you know, they're being attacked. We don't want people to feel guilty, but we do want people to realize that, you know, everyone's on a journey. Everyone needs to start thinking about how they've acted in the past and how we can start to act in the future. And we're going to take pick that up. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, that was a really, really good question. Thank you, Izzy. What I would what I would suggest is um, 
of course, it's important to have these sort of kinds of conversations with empathy and with kindness and with patience. But I also think that if you could, um, if you could find people in the organization who are at a leadership level for mentoring, because I know someone talked about reverse mentoring before, but someone that you feel comfortable in speaking to so you can share your, um, you share your concerns, share your, um, your aims and objectives with that person so they can also be a support for when you are trying to have these challenging conversations. And I think it's really amazing that you are taking this um, opportunity to have these conversations. But what I really want to make sure is that you, that, you're, that you are, that your safety is the most important thing and that you don't feel uncomfortable to have these conversations and they put you in an awkward position. So that's why I always think it's important to have um, allyship across the organization. So someone in leadership that you can, that's a mentor, that's someone that you trust, that you can speak to, and that can also support you when you're trying to have these conversations as well. Does that make sense? Um, also, if you just drop me an email, I'd love to support you on this as well and invite you to the other box community because it's a space specifically for things like this too. Brilliant. I'll drop my email actually in the chat. Who else has got a question they're burning to ask? Um, there's a couple here that are in the in the in the selection. Um, I was quite interested in the one around. Um, it's sort of Wangu. I think you asked it in two different ways over the course of it. The first one I think that you asked Wangu was, what sort of design tools can you do to try and bypass some of these biases that are bubbling up in an almost unconscious way in organization. Maybe that's not fair to what you were going to ask. Wangu, do you want to ask your question yourself rather than me paraphrase it for you? He's on mute. Maybe he's gone. <laughs> Are you still there? Hi, hi, hi. hi um, yeah, so I, um, I sort of find that a lot of the time when you sort of talk about unconscious bias training, it, it almost reinforce it reinforces pe people's biases because people don't want to feel as if their own autonomy is being limited in some, in some way. So I think, you know, I think um, I'm seeing a lot of stuff about like diversity by design and how, and how organizations are trying to create um, social capital around engaging in, in diversity. Like I know the NHS have this, the, um, the badges, so things that people can, can use to show that they are allies and, that, and thereby creating social capital around diversity and making it more likely to uh, kick off within, within the organization. I was wondering, are there, are there any other sort of tricks like that to sort of um, bypass people's own choice and make, and make the organization just naturally run in a diverse and inclusive manner rather than it being something which limits people's own autonomy in, any, in, in a way. Do one of you want to go for that? Thank you, Wang. Is that, um, Yulia, maybe? Is that something which... Or anyone, actually. Is that a tough question? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm happy to take it, but I realise I've, I've spoken a lot. <laughs> Yeah. I think what's really important, um, I missed a little bit of that question, um, but from what I would like to say about unconscious bias training is that it's not, a, it, a lot of people treat it like a plaster that you can just stick on and it's going to fix a DNI problem within a company. Whereas actually what it is, is a step for you to start to raise your awareness of something, to raise your awareness of what your biases are. But the way that we approach it is, where do they come from? Why do we have biases? How can we then counteract our biases so that we are thinking in more inclusive ways? But so it, the way that we kind of describe it is that if you kind of go through life with like tunnel vision, we're just expanding that vision so you can really begin to see things in a more holistic and inclusive way. So unconscious bias, like, I completely agree that um, a lot of people use it as a, oh, let's just do unconscious bias training and it'll fix everything. But it, it really isn't. It's just the first step that you should take to raise your awareness and then, and then go from there. So that's, I mean, I'm not sure if that answered your question, <laughs> but. You get your, your, um, your back on. Oh. Um, you know, I think we, we all recognize that you can't do the sort of training in a sort of asynchronistic manner. And these are just, you know, some of the tools. But I'm just I'm really looking for sort of practical things an organization can, can implement so that, so that it doesn't become a, a matter of choice. Are there any sort of, um, you know, if someone said the next, the next day, sort of, sort of like, blind, like blind interviews, that these sort of things that, that organizations can practically do instead of sort of raise, raising the consciousness of the organization. 
I think the interesting, I'm not sure if it, it would help or it answers your question. I think the interesting development I saw is contextualizing of CVs. So it's not really, you know, it exactly speaks to, um, it's no choice not to, so it, well, it helps diversity and inclusion in a way that you can see people achieve, people's achievements in a different light. And I think there is a company called Rare Recruitment that um, helps just position people's achievements because one of the things about, you know, understanding privilege, you, you just don't understand what it was like for somebody else to achieve the same level as you have because they had to work harder, they have to do lots of other different things. And I think if you start contextualizing this achievement, you realize that actually, you know, the sheer greed, resilience and all the other different qualities to get to the same point um it was very different and i think one of my favorite videos in this regard you probably saw it guys is the hundred dollar race um it's uh, a video you've probably seen that probably leia have you no? yeah is it the one i yeah, probably have yeah yeah but i think it's just understanding what the privilege actually is and getting people to emotionally connect with it but at the same time understand that um actually bringing in this different perspective and different talent, it adds to their competences. And if you start building different recruitment processes, it definitely works. But I think it's also, so it's kind of a the systemic element from the um, HR perspective, but what also worked, and we did some of this in, um, in John Lewis and Waitrose, is you start celebrating different cultures and there are so many different things you can do. And um, and in some of the shops, obviously waitress, it's all about food. I spoke about porridge already, but it's sharing food from different cultures and people talking about their heritage. And suddenly there was conversation flow in all sorts of directions. And I think it kind of, if people challenge their biases, as Le Leia was talking about, we all have biases because of the experiences we have. But if you challenge the assumption about the certain individual, certain characteristic is X, but if you broaden um, this dimension and actually they have more um, sort of schemas that fit into this particular um, person, uh, this particular person with these characteristics, that would be better. So if you try to see people in different light and just organize events that help bring out the um, different dimensions on every individual, and that it's it's something that helps and also i think the other thing is teams are so important and i think mark was talking about the creating the environment and team and having honest conversation as this the environment of psychological safety and trust that helps people actually explain that something that somebody thought was a joke was microaggression but it's just if you achieve this um, the trust within a team that can um, it can go a long way because if you start with a team as a unit then you broaden it to organization and it's always easier to start somewhere and if you start small and then roll it out and expand um, so, yeah um, Sorry. this is this conversation needs to be a lot longer and a lot deeper of course than what we've managed to get through in it's amazing how time flies. I don't know whether you feel that, but the fact that so many of you are still here suggests it does. What, what I would like um, is the three speakers, Mike too, actually, sorry, the four speakers, to get, take a moment and we'll close with this, I think, and then we can carry on the conversation um, on LinkedIn, I guess. We tried to do it on a different platform, but it was too much of a pain in the ass, to be perfectly frank with you all. Um, so what I'd love you to think about is, given what you've heard today, and, and your own experience and what what's the sort of give us one thing to take away that we should really ponder overnight and put on our list of you know take action on tomorrow it can be something which was raised in the conversation it could be something that wasn't mentioned i don't you know i don't mind but i know for myself i've got to filter three or four sides of notes from this and re-listen to it and go back through the conversation and work out which of the things i'm going to take first but i've got a lot of things to get on with so Help us out, guys. Um, any of you can go first. Liam, one... Liam, I'll go first. Uh, it would take one minute, but it's worth it, hopefully. Um, Do it. Night of my graduation, uh, it would have been a, a non-eventful night other than my best friend's father, when we were out for a meal, said these words to us. He said, um, as I look before you, I'm jealous. 
the reason I'm jealous is because from this position you can achieve almost anything in the world. But at the same time, I pity you because for 20 years you'll go in search of success. And after those 20 years, when maybe your best years are behind you, you'll realize it's not about success, it's about significance. But the really smart people figure out how to achieve success and significance simultaneously. So we'd had a few drinks, but it was profound words. It haunted all of us in a positive way. Tried to live my life that way. And I, it's not my words, it's not my story, but I try and tell as many people as will bloody listen, because I think it's a really good way of understanding how you can achieve that intersection and there's abundant energy in that overlapping Venn diagram of success and significance. I love it. I think I'm going to tell that story as well. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, one of our other speakers. I think for me, it's more of an action. So I would just encourage everybody who's watching and listening to really start to examine and diversify the, what you're consuming. So on social media, your TV, your films, your music, and really start to expose yourself to different narratives that fall with outside of the, the, the mainstream. That's brilliant. Yeah. Does the other box do stuff like that? In any, in a, does it, not the other box do stuff like that, but is there an easy way to, like I speak to a friend, they say, check out this link, check out that movie, check out this, follow that person, listen yeah. to this podcast. How, how might be an easy way to get to that list? So we're always sharing resources and links and shows and music and things that you should be watching and listening on our Instagram and our Twitter and our LinkedIn. Um, and then also our training is available for individuals, but also for companies as well. So definitely check it out. Lovely. Thank you, Leah. That's great. Hello, Topi or Topi's baby has arrived very sweetly. <laughs> um, Yulia uh, um, and Mike. Here's Mike. Um, to be honest, I think the, in, I would echo um, Leia's sentiments about action and what also really resonated with me is this curiosity. And I think it's definitely, if there is one thing you can do is um, just talk to somebody in your team who has different background than you and just be more curious about where they're from and what it's like for them. But it's... Um, in a form of even relaxed conversation. Because I remember talking to um, one of our team members who's a Muslim, what the experience of Ramadan was like. It was eye-opening. And it's just, it's kind of asking people questions and then it kind of, their story becomes part of your story. So you kind of, you expand your horizons as well. And I think the more you ask questions, the more curious you are, the better. And great news that marketeers are very... Uh, curious now that I know that. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. Um, Mike? Hey, final sorry. part of the so, so, Leo, I get the last word. How am I, how am I going to do that? I don't know. Uh, but I'll be quick. I guess I'll be simple as well. For me, it's people, people, people. We work in a people-oriented business. I think a lot of people I work with are interested in people. So you just gotta get, you just gotta chat, engage, and be interested in others. I don't think you should like be overcomplicated. Mm. And I probably should have mentioned this, but at my old agency, there was like a weekly bar night, which probably got me into trouble more than it should have. Thanks for that. But, but, but it was, seriously, it was a great way of study conversations and engagements that wouldn't normally happen in a kind of day-to-day -day work setting. So yeah, that's my message. Just talk to people, engage, and have a bit of fun at the same time. Absolutely true to form, totally on brand, uh, Mike comment there. Thank you. Um, Guys, I, I really appreciate the effort that you've made to turn up tonight, all of you, uh, speakers, those who ask questions, those who listened, those who come once, those who've come many times. I, I, I can't tell you how sustaining it's been, I think, for me personally and for everyone to be involved in this over the lot. We've done 10 of these over the time of the lockdown. We're going to take a little sort of summer break of some kind and think uh, again, thank you for filling in the poll. Think again about how best to do these going forwards. But um, I know that each time we spark 100 conversations, and if any of those turn into actions, then it's 100 people doing something different, which is always, always, always brilliant. So um, please stay in touch. Please drop us a note. 
um, if you want to speak or get involved, you know, we'll do that. And um, I think we'll probably leave it there. It's probably time for a proper lunch in New York or a, a proper dinner in London or whatever you're doing, wherever you are. So um, thank, thank you. you hugely. Thank you so yeah, much for yeah. having us. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you making your time available and um, leading the conversation today. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.